पृथिवी शांतिरंतरिक्षगम शांतेर द्यव शांतेर दिशा शांतिरवांतर दिशा शांतिरग्निशांतेर वायु शांतिरादित्य शांतेर चंद्रमा शांतेर नक्षत्राणी शांतिराप शांति रोषदय शांति वनस्पत यशांति गौ शांति रजा शांति रश्व शांति पुरुष शांति ब्रह्म शांति ब्राह्मण शांति शांति रेव शांति शांति रुमे अस्तु शांति ही May there be peace on earth and in the sky. May there be peace in the water and in all directions. May there be peace in the plants, in the trees and in animals. May there be peace in the hearts of all beings. May there be peace in everyone and in everything. Sarvetra Sukhina Santo सर्वे सन्तु निरामयाहा सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कश्चित् दुःख भाग भवेत् सर्वस्तरतु दुर्गाणि सर्वो भद्राणि पश्यतु सर्वसद्बुद्धिमाप्नोतु सर्वसर्वत्र नन्दतु मे ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्दी May all see what is good, and may no one experience misery. May all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies. May people everywhere find joy and fulfilment. Let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness. As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength and compassion. And as we breathe out, let us release all the stress, anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind. Let us practice this way for a while. Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in everyone, the Divine Presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. In order to focus our mind, we can take the help of a short prayer or a mantra or a Divine Name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts.
असतोमा सत्कमया तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमया आविरावीर्मे थी रुद्रयक्ते तक्षिण मुखम तेन मि नि May the divine lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality may the divine consciousness fill our hearts and protect us so we shall begin where we stopped before the summer recess um good to have everyone back and hope you had a good summer so just to very briefly summarize what we had seen before this there was a break the summer break so to quickly recapitulate right from the beginning of the book the book begins by first in uh how would i put it almost alerting the reader alerting the student about taking note of something that is often taken for granted and that is just the human birth if we believe in the idea of rebirth then we can be born any number of times and just because we are in having a human birth now this itself is not a guarantee that if you are born again it will we'll be human beings again from the theory of rebirth it's still a theory there is no evidence there is no proof so um some people might believe in it some people may not believe in it but if if you believe that a rebirth is possible then according to that theory the way it is formulated we can be born in any of the species we don't have to be born as human beings again and up from our present understanding because the way we try to understand life the world our place in it is from a very human perspective because we are human beings we have got a human mind and we really don't have much choice we have to see the world from a human perspective we have no idea when a dog looks at the world or a cat looks at the world what the dog or cat is thinking what how a dog mind imagines the world how a cat we don't know so all of our philosophies all of our theories are from a human perspective sometimes they might seem self serving but in any case the way we see the world we see that the human beings are a culmination or at the top of the evolutionary ladder that in many ways from our perspective while animals are great uh, dogs can be adorable but still they are not as evolved as human beings and so we somehow think it's a greater good fortune to be born in a human body than in any other body if we believe in that then it's important to value the opportunity we have got think about the probability that if we are born again and according to the vedantic world view unless we become spiritually enlightened as long as there is ignorance covering us we will if if we can be born once we can be born another time and according to that way of thinking think about the probability of being born 
a human being again. And since human birth is so precious because we can attain to that state of transcendence only in this birth, we have to recognize that blessing. Only when we recognize that blessing, only when we don't take it for granted, will we make sure that this life is not wasted. That when we look back at our lives, no matter what stage of life we are in, we will have the satisfaction that while our lives may not have been perfect, but whatever opportunities became available to us, whatever knowledge, talents, skills we had, we have, as much as it was possible, tried to put it to good use. Even if it is not perfect, but still we have done our best. That kind of a satisfaction is very important. Then in the early, probably the third verse, the book said, in addition to being a human being, if we have a serious interest in spiritual life, if spiritual ideals are not simply one of the several ideals possible, but that they hold a special meaning in my life, then I'm still a rarer blessing that I've had. A human birth, because there are, well, there are so many human beings, not everyone takes spiritual life seriously. So if I'm a human being and I'm taking spiritual life seriously, I'm still a very small minority in among the human species. Not Everyone who is a human being and who takes spiritual life seriously have the opportunity to come in contact with an enlightened being, to come in contact with a spiritual soul or opportunities in life to pursue the spiritual path. So if one has all of these three, then you can see how rare a blessing that is. And the book then goes on to say that if we have one, two, three, or all of these, then if we don't make the best use of this opportunity, then that is the real suicide. Just taking one's life, yes, that's suicide, and that's bad enough. But by the theory of rebirth, suicide doesn't solve any problem. We'll get a body again. And the mind, if, if it's a tortured mind that is pushing someone to take their own life, doesn't solve the problem because that same tortured mind will be reborn again in a different body. But a worse suicide is having had the blessing of being born a human being, of having interest in spiritual life, having had the opportunity to pursue the spiritual path, I still don't give my best to it. So that's how the book begins. And then we are told about the primary basic disciplines. There are the four. In Sanskrit, they call it Viveka, Vairagya, Shamadi, Shat Sampatti, and Mumukshutva. Which simply, Viveka is discernment, which is what is translated in the text of the book, the title of the book as looking deeply. The ability to look deeply and be able to see things clearly. That's important, not just in spiritual life really, in every aspect of life. As we, when we are walking on the sidewalk, um, especially as it gets darker or in winter when it's snowy, if I don't look deeply, don't look clearly, I might slip and fall down and hurt myself. That kind of falling down and hurting myself can occur physically. It can also occur psychologically, emotionally, intellectually, and of course spiritually. And therefore looking deeply, looking clearly is very important. After looking deeply and being recognizing what is good for me, what is not good for me, what is healthy, what is not healthy, then I must have the detachment, the willpower to keep away everything that is unhealthy, everything that is weakening, and to hold on to only thing that which is strengthens me. And in order to do that, what powers this practice is this six qualities that are mentioned in the third requirement, uh, restraint of the body and the mind, the ability to withdraw the mind every time it goes 
to where I, I don't want it to go. The uh, a deep faith in the higher reality, forbearance, because no matter how perfectly we might want our life to go, all of us want our life to be hassle-free. That's a natural human um, hope. But we know that no matter how hard we do things, how careful we are, there are circumstances and forces beyond our control. So there are going to be difficulties. There are going to be discomforts. There are going to be things that can be irritating. There, there are going to be things that we hate. Now, if every time I react strongly to any of these things, that becomes an obstacle in whatever goal I'm pursuing. So a certain amount of forbearance, the ability to forbear. Yes, recognize things are not great, but to be able to kind of ride the wave, as they say. So if we have that, then that is also very helpful in spiritual life. And then finally, intense longing. And that's true with any pursuit. If I want to be a musician, if I want to study music or learn a certain musical instrument, unless I long for it, unless I love it, unless I want to do it, uh, I might have, I might have a good teacher nearby, I might have all the facilities, I might have a good expensive violin, for instance, if I want to learn practicing violin. All of those things will be there, but I have no real desire to do it. Then I won't be able to do it. So it begins with these four basic disciplines. And then we are introduced to a dialogue between the teacher and the student. And the entire book is really a dialogue between a teacher and the student. And then we come to these two big sections, which we saw. For the first section is about what was called as the three bodies, a three layers, so to speak. Um, the word body, because the, in Sanskrit they use the word sharira, and that often gets translated into English as bodies, um, which might sound odd, because body is the what really we refer to the, the body that we see. But the way the word body is used in this context is really the different coverings over my true self, my true being. So this, this body is really the visible covering, tangible. I can see it, I can feel it. But within the body, we know that we are not just physical beings, that there is the mind, there is the intellect, there are the emotions, there are the feelings, a lot of parts of my personality which are invisible, which no surgeon will find if the body is cut open, but yet there are parts of me. So all of these things taken together are seen as an invisible covering. And so sometimes the, they use the word, the subtle body, sukshma sharira in Sanskrit. And then within, so there is the gross body, there is the subtle body, and then inside that is what they use the word karana sharira or causal body, which really means just ignorance. And as we have seen, and we will see again and again, how the whole process of creation, this diversity that we encounter, begins with, with ignorance. And that is considered the primary cause of the multiplicity we encounter in the world. So the first section dealt with these three coverings over the self. And the real me, the true self, the divine within, is really covered by these three layers. Now these same three layers can also be conceptualized in a, in a different way. And uh, they use a different word for that and they call it the word kosha. So these same three coverings can be visualized as five different layers. And we saw before this summer the first four of these. In Sanskrit they call it annamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, vijnanamaya kosha. And simply translated, the first is, literally it would mean the, the layer of the food, anna, anna is food. But it's the same word often used in ancient Vedanta texts to refer to material things. So the material layer, and we know the human body is, is a material object. As much as we might want to distinguish it from a table and a chair, 
because, well, this seems alive and conscious right now. But we know that once a person dies, the corpse is as motionless, as, as immobile as any inanimate object. If, if, um, if a table and a dog and a human body are burned to ashes, and we just have three heaps of ash, there is no way to know which ash belongs to whom. So the material nature of the body is well known. Today we also know the chemical composition of the body. So that's pretty clear. But what about the other, the invisible part? The, the prana, the vital force, the life, that which is life. So life is seen as a subtle, subtle layer. Um, within that is seen the mind. Within that is what's called the Vidnyanamai Kosha, literally would mean the layer of knowledge. But as we see the description of it and the way it is conceptualized, it is primarily the knowledge of being the doer. Because before we do any activity, and by activity I don't simply mean physical activity, even thinking is an activity, it's a mental activity. So whether whatever I do with my body or mind I cannot do it unless and until I become aware of the fact that I am the doer, I am the agent of action. Without that awareness, no activity is possible. And that is why in deep sleep, when we are not even dreaming, there is no activity. Because there is no awareness, there is no knowledge that I am the doer. And so, although it's called the layer of knowledge, it's primarily the layer of the I, the ego, as the agent of action, as karta. So these were the first four layers that we studied before we close for the summer. And what we will do today, we'll go to the fifth and final layer. And that's literally, it's called the layer of bliss. In Sanskrit, the name is Ananda Mayakosha. And this is important. This layer is important because... There's the word ananda there. And one of the ways or one of the terms that is often used in Vedanta is satchit ananda, that the self or the divine is often described in terms of existence, knowledge, bliss. The same word ananda is used. And so because we have the word ananda here, sometimes people have gotten a little bit confused, thinking, well, Anandamaya, so this is this the self then? Because there is the word Ananda here. And that is the question that will be resolved as we look at the description of this fifth layer today. So let's look at verse number 207. <coughs> I'll read the Sanskrit first. <coughs> Ananda Pratibimba Chumbita Tanur Pratistamo Jrumbhita Born of ignorance, the layer of bliss embodies the reflection of the blissful Atman. It includes enjoyment in diverse forms and arises when desired objects are attained. It manifests brightly when the virtuous experience the fruits of their good deeds and when all living beings experience bliss without any effort. So let's look at it piece by piece. So this innermost layer, the layer of bliss, is tamo jrumbhita, mean born of ignorance. So right away we see that a product of ignorance will be, will have the characteristics of ignorance. It's like um, uh, a clay jar. Uh, any object made of clay, while it will serve different functions, its characteristics will not be different from a clay. It is essentially just clay. So, all of these different layers have originated from ignorance. So, the characteristics of ignorance 
will also be the characteristics of this layer. So the, it says the layer of bliss embodies the reflection of the blissful Atman. So since this layer is, if you visualize them as uh, layers coming one after another, the external, the most, the layer which is outside is the layer, the layer of the body, then the prana, then the mind, then the ego. So this one is the innermost. And if we think of the Atman as the innermost essence of who I truly am, then visually at least it would seem as if this layer being the innermost is the closest to the Atman. An Atman is this true self, the real self. And it is the nature of the Atman of Satchitananda. At existence belongs to the Atman. The Atman is of the nature of pure consciousness. And the Atman is truly blissful. So all of these characteristics belong to the Atman. So what it means is, and this is something we have seen before, is right now I feel I exist. My body exists. This exists. My mind exists. So this connection of the, or the, or the transference of existence to the body might seem as if it belongs to the body. But what this formulation shows is that existence really belongs to the Atman. But because they are in close proximity, it kind of seems to lend its qualities to the covering. It's a little bit like the, the, the lights that we see. So really, the, the fixture itself is not luminous. If you switch off the power, it doesn't give any light. But right now, the bulbs look very luminous. But that luminosity doesn't belong to the bulb. It comes from the electric power. So similarly, the existence of the body, the existence doesn't belong to the body. That existence comes from this Atman which is inside. So similarly, the bliss, blissful layer, because it is the closest layer, it is the bliss of the Atman that gets reflected through this layer. Now, we might say that the Atman is always present. No. Well, Atman is always present. I am the Atman, so it's, we are always there. Um, so why aren't we ex experiencing that Ananda, the bliss, all the time? And the answer is that it's not as if the, the bliss of the Atman is switched on and off. That's the nature of the Atman. It's perennially blissful. It cannot stop being blissful. And yet, we don't experience bliss all the time. And the reason for that is not difficult to guess, that when there is a certain sound, let's say, we will hear that sound, and if that sound is not overpowered or overshadowed by some other sound. And so simultaneously, want to, and sometimes it could happen. And that's why we... There's a big industry now with noise cancelling headphones because we don't want to hear all of the sound. We just want to hear whatever it is that we want to hear. So, but that mechanism doesn't exist in real life as far as happiness is concerned. So the bliss of the Atman is continuously being emitted. But the other layers that are present in us, there is a lot of tension, stress, anxiety, worry, fear, all of these things that are embodied in our personality, in these other layers, they, they overshadow or cover the bliss. And that is why we don't, we don't experience that bliss all the time. Except in two times it happens. One is, as the book points out, it manifests brightly when the virtuous experience the fruits of their good deeds. Oftentimes we have seen that when we do something good, um, or when we are successful in some measure, it makes us happy. 
And so what is being pointed out is that those moments or times of bliss and happiness in our life, that is the time the bliss from this layer is being manifest more. Manifest to the extent that we are able to experience it and enjoy it. And the second time, now for this one, the what the book, what this verse said, the word, the virtuous experience the fruits of their good deeds. Now, to do good deeds, some effort is necessary. Well, to do any deed, effort is necessary. And so, if I do something good and it's successful, it makes me happy. But there is also bliss can come without effort. Every night when we go to sleep, uh, clearly our waking state stops for a while and then we sleep. But, and then there are two states that occur in our state of sleep. One is the state of dream and we all dream. Uh, sometimes we remember our dreams, many times we don't. But there is also the third state when we are neither awake nor are we dreaming. And then that is called the deep sleep. In Sanskrit they call sushupti. Now in that state of deep sleep, the body hasn't disappeared, but the body has become non-functional. Not as much non-functional as when someone is dead. Clearly the breathing is going on because we still wake up the next morning. So some of these functions which don't require our active participation, whether we know it or not. In fact, most of the time we are not even aware that we are breathing. Most of the time we are not even aware that the blood is being circulated, the heart is pumping blood. Uh, but that's something that begins immediately after we are born, immediately at birth, immediately after conception really, and it ends only when at the time of death. So whether we are aware of it or not, there are a lot of functions happening in the body without our knowledge. So, but all of the voluntary actions that we do, they are completely stopped in the state of sleep. But the mind is active when we are dreaming. And that's why all of the dreams are really the projections of the mind in different ways. But in that state of deep sleep, both the body and the mind, both are at rest. And because they are both at rest, all of the tensions and stress and anxiety and worry that we might experience in waking and sometimes in dream, because people get nightmares as well, all of those things are absent in deep sleep. And because they are absent, that is the time the bliss in this layer is able to manifest without any obstruction, without any overshadowing by anything. And that's why, while our experience in the waking state and the dream state might be mixed, the deep sleep state is always blissful. And because this layer is the only layer that is functional or operational in the deep sleep state, and because that experience is of bliss, that is how it gets the name Anandamaya Kosha, the Anandamaya layer, the layer of bliss. <laughs> so this idea is further clarified in the very next verse. Look at verse number 208. <laughs> Anandamaya Koshasya Sushupta Uspruti Rutkata Swapna Jagara Yorishat Ishta Sandarshana Dina the layer of bliss manifests intensely in the deep sleep. In waking and dream states, it manifests mildly on occasions, such as when something agreeable is seen. So it's pretty clear that while the bliss itself is continuous without any gap, because there are obstructions to that manifestation in the waking and in dream states, we don't feel it as intensely as the bliss we experience in the state of deep sleep. <clears throat> Verse 209. As is the, uh, the 
the template that is followed in the earlier verses, as you might remember, every time they begin with the description of the new layer, after the description is given, then we are given the reasons why it is a layer, why it is not the real self. And that is what is done in verse 209. Naivayam ananda mayaparatma sopadhi katvat prakriter vikarat karyatva hetoho sukrita kriyayam vikara sanghat samahi tatvat. The layer of bliss is not the Supreme Self because it has limitations. The Sanskrit word, it really means upadhi, that this layer, as long as it is limited by some characteristic, it cannot be the Supreme Self. Because the Supreme Self, the truth, the, the Atman, is without any boundaries. There is nothing to limit it. But this particular layer is, is the ego as the experiencer. And therefore it is limited by that identity. Because it is then dependent on the experience. It, it is a product of ignorance. And that is why it vanishes. When a person becomes enlightened, the layer of bliss no longer remains. Because just as when the sun rises, all darkness vanishes. When knowledge arises, all ignorance and all the products of ignorance, they all disappear. It is the result of meritorious deeds. And we saw how when something good happens in our life, we feel happy. And so this layer is dependent on a cause. It's dependent on something good being done or is dependent on the state of deep sleep. And therefore, it is not the Supreme Self. It is lodged within other layers, which are also products of ignorance. And the idea is it is identical with the other layers. The other layers are as much a product of ignorance as this layer is. So this brings to an end the discussion on five layers. So we saw the three bodies, we saw the five layers. And the next verse then begins the new section on the self, the Atman. Within these three bodies or within these five layers is the Atman. The, again, although we, are, we call it the Atman and I be, I'm saying it, referring to it as it, it's always good to translate it in our own minds, every time the word Atman comes, there's some kind of a bell should go inside and say, that's the real me. Right now, when we say I, that is the Atman who has forgotten itself. Our present I is really the I of the ego. The ego is not the real self. The Atman is behind the ego. So ego, you could say, is kind of the fake Atman. And um, if we continue holding on to the fake Atman, we will never be able to find the real Atman. And so we'll look at the next verse, which begin the section. Um, and then we will we'll stop here for today. So look at verse 210. Panchanam api koshanam nishedhe yuktita shrutehe tan nishedha vadhi sakshi bodha rupo vashishyate. When all the five layers are negated to the utmost with reasoning based on the Vedas, what remains is the witness whose nature is consciousness. So when all of these five layers are negated, what does negation mean? And Sri Ramakrishna gives a, a, a beautiful analogy to this, which can be very helpful. And he says that if a, a villager um, who wants to go and meet the king or the queen now, so it's she's so much in the news. Uh, so anyway, Ramakrishna's story, he referred to the king, I think. Um, so if, if a villager who has never been to the palace, never seen the king, only heard about the king and wants to go and meet. And so as he nears the palace of the king, he sees someone at the door who's, who's dressed immaculately well and, and very uh, shining apparel and you know something very, which this 
poor little person from a distant place had never seen anyone dressed like that. And he immediately mistake, oh, this must be the king. And he's about to bow down when this person at the gate says, oh, no, 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 I'm not the king. Um, you better go inside. I'm just uh, the guarding the gate. So then this person said, okay, oh, he's not the king. Then he goes inside and there's another door and there's another one person standing there dressed up, you know, even finer uh, clothes and appearance. And so he said, oh, maybe this may be the king. And then, and then, he's, then that person, you know, I'm not the king. And so the story goes, he goes inside, there's a third door and fourth door and fifth door and he goes inside. And finally, when he stands before the king, the real king, there is no question in his mind at all. There are no doubts. Then he knows, like, this is the real king. So just as the earlier three or four doors crossing, they were negated. He first mistook them to be a king and later learned they are not the king. That's the kind of a negation that is called for here. So when we first think about ourselves, clearly the first thing I would think universally that comes to mind is, this is me. And so we just point to our body. Now a negation would mean I begin to think deeply about it and say, am I really this? But this came into being only when I was born. Does that mean I wouldn't exist? I wasn't existing before I was born? This is going to die. This is going to be reduced to just dust at some point. That means, am I just going to be dust? And a purely materialistic view would be that. Some people who don't believe in the afterlife, don't believe in God, don't care for religion. They say, well, there is nothing. This is just, you live as long as you live, and then everything ends. There are people who believe, or at least say they believe in that way. But there are many others who believe, no, there is, there is something more in me than just the body. So when this way I begin to think, then the, I go beyond this first door, I go inside, then I find this life, vitality. Yes, that's something more subtle. That seems closer to who I am. And then you go further inside, you find the mind, you discover the ego, you discover it. And so you go inside, 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 until you stand in the presence of the, the king inside, the divine being within. So the section that we will study beginning next week will be about the Atman, the nature of the Atman, what role it plays. We saw the coverings, now we see the Atman. It's, it's such a fascinating way this book has been arranged. So we saw the layers, now we see the Atman, the self. But we know right now it's all got mixed up in our heads. When we already read the book, it kind of seems very systematic. Five layers, three bodies. But as we go about our day-to-day -day activities, we're not aware of any layers, any three bodies. We just think, this is who I am. So all of these things have gotten muddled up, mixed up in our head. And so the, the second part, the next section, after we finish with the Atman, will show what do I need to do to, to separate these out? How will I know that my true identity is the self and these layers or these other external coverings are not the real me? So that's how the structure of the book is. So I'll, I'll stop you now. If you have any thoughts, ideas, comments, questions, feel free to ask. Hi, I'm Swamiji. Swamiji, so it seems bliss is more of reducing rather than, to, sorry, to, to experience bliss, it's more of reducing than adding things to our lives as we see in deep sleep. So what can we do in the waking world to, what should we reduce in yeah, the waking good, world? Yeah, good question. You see, the bliss or anand that belongs only to the Atman. There is no joy in anything in the world. That's the premise here. But then we might find if I love ice cream, let's say, and then I, here is an ice cream which comes and I eat it and I feel happy. So 
it's natural to kind of connect that bliss with that ice cream. Because before the ice cream came, I wasn't happy. Once I started tasting, especially when it was on my tongue and it was melting, and it was so delicious, and I feel so happy. So the cause and effect relationship becomes obvious that way. But that's where we, the, we get deluded. Is the bliss present in the ice cream? Or is that bliss coming from somewhere else? Because while most people might love ice cream, there are some people who hate it. And so the same ice cream, if it could bring joy to me, and maybe someone who just hates it, say, I don't want that ice cream, I hate it. So the point is, if, if the, the bliss was contained in the ice cream itself, everyone should have been happy. But that's not the experience of everyone. Probably I didn't take a good example. Ice cream pretty much I think most people might like. But there are a lot of things which some people like and some people don't. Uh, so the question is, from where did the bliss come? Now, one of the explanations which is interesting is this, that let's say I love eating some particular dish. Now, when I feel the desire to eat that dish, uh, desire is a kind of a, a, a disturbance in my mind. It's kind of the waves in the mind, right? Like, I want it, I want to get it, I want to get it. When will I get it? And if, if little children will start crying and yelling if they want something and don't get it immediately. Um, but once then I get what I want, it immediately calms the disturbance in my heart. Because as when I'm enjoying it, then the desire is being fulfilled. That desire. Doesn't mean all the desires, but that desire is fulfilled. Now that short momentary calmness that comes with the, with the fulfillment of a desire, when the lake of my mind, if we imagine the mind to be like a water, and, and the desires and thoughts in it like ripples and waves, when that desire is fulfilled, the waters become calm a little bit. When it is calm, then the bliss of the Atman shines forth clearly. In a disturbed water, the reflection is not very clear. And then we associate that bliss as coming from that object, which in fact has happened because of the fulfillment of desire. And clearly, of course, that state doesn't remain for too long. Once again, another desire comes and the mind gets disturbed again, and I'm no more longer blissful again. Sometimes they give the example of a, a camel. Camel in a, in a desert sometimes stops uh, and there are a lot of these thorny bushes and a camel is kind of chewing at the leaves. And when the leaves are being chewed, the, the thorns and the plants sometimes may, may pierce and, and some blood might come. And um, because it's a desert land and it's very dry, and, and that blood mixes with the, the leaves that the camel is eating. And the camel is apparently not aware, according to the story, about where that juice is coming from. The camel thinks, ah, finally I've chewed it and getting the juice out of this leaf. But really, the juice is nothing but the camel's own blood. But it is attributing that, that sweetness, that juice, to the leaves where it's actually its own. So that's the example they sometimes give to show that all the bliss that we get, we attribute it to things in the world, but really that bliss is coming from inside. So Vikram, does that answer your question? I, I, I went on a tangent somewhere far away with that. <laughs> so if we recognize that all the bliss that we want is within us. That, in fact, our running after and hankering after perishable material objects is really interrupting that bliss. Rather than being the source of bliss, it will save us a lot of trouble. So that's the idea behind it. And therefore, I mean, one of the things is this, that in deep sleep, the world is absent. There are no material objects present there. 
and yet I feel blissful. So that's how we know that that bliss that is within me is not coming from any external object because there is no object in the deep sleep. So that bliss is coming from my own self. Namaskar Maharaj. <clears throat> so, in this book I see that Maya has two-folds job here. Like, <clears throat> it's the product of ignorance, all the courses. And the nearest to the bliss is the Ananda Mahikasa. So, is it true that these two functions that we see here, one is the ignorance of Maya, that is The other one is like the ignorance in Bengali, I cannot understand. The ignorance Maya and the other one is Vidya Maya. Vidya Maya. Vidya Maya and Vidya Maya. So, when the ignorance, product of ignorance, gives all the ignorance and Maya, ignorance Maya gives us, but the one which is Ananda Maya, Kosha, when it lights up with the bliss of the self, then we get the, with the help of Vidya Maya, we get that. No, 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 that, I think you're mixing up two different things. Yeah, please, please sit down. The, what you are referring to uh, is the concept that Ramakrishna mentioned about Maya, that Maya has a positive side to it and a negative side to it. And the negative side is clearly, everything is a product of ignorance. But there are things in this world which immerse me more and more deeply into ignorance. And that is what Ramakrishna said is avidya maya. But there are other things which are also products of ignorance, but which will help me get out of that ignorance. For instance, now all of the spiritual practices that we do, whether it's prayer, worship, meditation, study, selfless service, all of these activities, we are using our body and mind. But the body and mind themselves are products of ignorance. So our relationship with the body and mind is a little complicated in the sense that we see that I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, but in order to know this, in order to experience this, I need the body and mind to do my spiritual practices. So I'm using these products of ignorance to help me get out of ignorance. That is, that is what Vidya Maya and Avidya Maya is. While the, the, the layer of the bliss is just one of the five layers. And it is, it's not as if the layer of the bliss is active only in deep sleep. It is active all the time. But we become aware of it in deep sleep only because the other four are absent there. But even in the waking state, the Anandamaya layer is still present. It is giving the same amount of bliss. But because all of the the material world present and the other layers and the stress and anxiety associated with them, we are not able to 
experience that bliss the way we experience sitting in deep sleep state. So it's it's so that's to be kept in mind that it's not simply functional only in deep sleep. It's functional all the time. Yeah. Any other thought? Yes. So, Swamiji, there was a word used, blissful Atman, in one of those verses. But how can we attribute any anything to Atman? How can Atman be blissful? You cannot. So why is it said blissful Atman? Well, no words are, we really don't even need the book for that matter. <laughs> Everything is a product of ignorance that way. Now, yeah, clearly, when you say blissful Atman, it just simply means Atman is not a product of suffering. You can say what the Atman is not. You can never say completely accurately what the Atman is because we are still using language and language itself is a limitation. So we are trying to express the inexpressible, which itself is a futile exercise really. But, but that's the best we can do. I mean, what else can we do? The only tools we have is the language. So we recognize the limitation of the language and try to do the best we can. We know that the only instruments available to us are the body and the mind. We know they are products of ignorance, but we know that if we use them well, they can help me get out of ignorance. That's how. Yes. Swamiji, then, uh, we also say the bliss, all of the bliss, so-called bliss, which I equate to happiness, but maybe they are two different concepts, or maybe they are the same. Yeah. We all, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Yeah. I think you understood what I was going to say. No, no, I may not have understood. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was wondering why, why do we attribute it to coming from Atman, this yeah. idea of bliss or happiness? I'm a little confused. We, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's just human nature. If I'm experiencing bliss, I would like, from where is it coming, right? So we have to say something, or we can say we don't know. That's the only option. And so it's, it's easier to think of the Atman as the source of everything if we truly see that the Atman alone exists really. There is nothing else. So if anything is coming or seems to be coming, that can be the only source from which it could come. Secondly, although we are kind of speaking about bliss so much and our own idea about bliss is oh happy and that kind of a thing, but but what the ancient Upanishads say, there is a word ananta there, not so much. I mean, the word ananda does come also, but the, the self is blissful because the self is infinite. There is one Upanishad called the Chandogya Upanishad, and it has this passage there which says, Yo vai bhuma tat sukham na alpe sukham asti bhuma eva sukham. What it means is simply this that that which is infinite is blissful. There is no bliss in the finite. The infinite alone is blissful. So, whatever has, whatever is perishable, whatever is finite, even if we, I give the example of ice cream, even if someone wants to believe that ice cream is the source of my bliss, but the ice cream is always, no matter you bring a jar full of ice cream, it's still a limited entity. It's perishable. So that which is limited and that which is perishable cannot give me an infinite, non-perishable happiness because the source is perishable, the effect will also be perishable. But if the source is infinite, then the effect will also be infinite in a, in a kind of a general sort of way. And so the Atman is blissful because the Atman is infinite. And there can be only one infinite, there can never be two infinites because then they will limit each other. And that's why the Atman is seen as the source of everything in life. Does that, does that solve the thing? 
Yes. So, Mitch, I'm just trying to understand your example of the ice cream. Um, so, order, Atman is blissful, but ice cream gave me some kind of happiness. So, in order to get that blissful, even though it's ignorant, so we need a desire, cause, and effect. So, why, if Atman is already blissful, why do we need desire, then cause and effect? Well, if Atman knew that I am the Atman, then there wouldn't be any problem. The, right now, the problem is the Atman is blissful, but Atman has forgotten that I am the Atman. And because the Atman has forgotten and fallen asleep, and therefore Atman is dreaming, and the, in the dream Atman sees I am a human being. It's a little bit like a king, a millionaire, falls asleep and starts dreaming, I am this homeless, penniless person wandering about. So all the wealth and joy and the bliss that this king has in the waking state is totally absent in the dream because in the dream this person has become like this. Um, and so that is essentially what had happened to the Atman. The Atman is blissful, joyful, divine, and the Atman has now fallen asleep and dreaming. I think, oh, I'm a human being, I'm mortal, and I have problem, and I have taxes to pay, and this is a problem, <laughs> and so on. <laughs> that's that's the, is the situation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we will stop here today, and then when we meet next week, we will continue with this section on the. जननी सारदा देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पादपद्मेतोश्रिवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मुहु So next Sunday, our subject will be Sri Ramakrishna's smile for the satsang. Next Wednesday, we'll continue this study. And this beginning this Saturday, our evening meditation will begin at 6 o'clock. So you're welcome for all of these programs. We'll conclude with a prayer now. May the Divine Being, who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish Faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Masta of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength, freedom, and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace, and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all.